Welcome back, everyone. So this is uh, continuing in a sense. Uh, we're going to see the final vignette from the package, but also I'm going to start to now tell you a bit more about some of the practical things related to the design of, of genomic selection and not just the predictions for our potato breeding program. And then we'll get to hear about a different example for blueberry, which should be interesting to see the comparison. So this is a, a chart that shows the progression of <clears throat> the stages for our phenotyping uh, in the potato breeding program at the University of Wisconsin. This is showing you for one market type, um, right? Potato is organized by market types the, and the different different uh, states emphasize different market types. Wisconsin, we do have breeding for russets and red potatoes, but we're the most, in terms of adopting genomic selection, we've gotten the farthest, uh, furthest in, in for the for this round white market category. So <clears throat> we, we count things based on the number of uh, field years. So we do our crossing and our seedling production, uh, seedling production in the same 12 month period. The crossing is done in a greenhouse on campus from January to let's say April. And then we turn around and extract the seeds and plant them uh, in May at, uh, at the research farm, and then transplant them in June into our three season greenhouses. So we have about 20,000 uh, genotypes in the round white category in small pots. Uh, a significant percentage of them uh, do not produce a large enough tu any tubers, or at least not a large enough tuber that could be used for field planting. So that's why the number is reduced primarily just for that reason from 20 to 15,000, let's say. And then our first year of selection, um, uh, our first year of selection in the field is based on a single plant. And it's really just a visual selection based on the, the maturity of the plant at the end of the season and what the tubers look like. The second year is our first clone selection where we have multiple plants for the same genotype. And there's a very large, you know, no more than five or five or ten percent of the plants of the genotypes from year one make it to to the year two. The year two selection is very similar uh, historically in terms of what traits are looked at, um, but I'll tell you in a minute about how that's changing soon. The big shift happens from year two to year three. Year three is what we not wide. This terminology is not widely used in potato breeding, but it's what you would call a preliminary yield trial if you were a grain breeder. It's basically a single plot. Now we're no longer at the, the seed farm. We're at a different location, which is more representative of the commercial production environments. And we're starting to collect a lot of the traits that, that uh, we can measure quantitatively and build, build prediction models. So that's why this year three was really the main focus um, in terms of uh, genotyping when I first started implementing that or preparing for genomic selection back in 2015, I, I, I keyed in on this trial, also made some changes to this trial. Actually, the, the, trial, the, the trial structure that I inherited, there was still visual selection in the field before they started measuring traits. So they would still essentially lift all the potatoes and lay them up on the ground, the tubers, and do visual selection and may not actually even record yield or other characteristics for um, you know, for half of them, but I realized that was a little bit of a lost opportunity. So now we harvest everything and uh, we're genotyping all of those individuals since 2015 with this SNP array. We also have the benefit that there is a lot of other public sector potato breeders. So a couple of years later in our scheme, we send our entries off to the national trials and we get, we get uh, over a hundred different clones from other breeders around the country, we were genotyping all of those as well as part of a collaborative effort. So we were able to build up to you know, numbers in a couple of years, we were well over 500 clones spanning a couple of years. And that was uh, at a point where I felt comfortable to start to use, use the prediction model. The, uh, the traits that, uh, that we collected and that seemed suitable for building a prediction model are shown here. We have total yield the specific gravity, which is basically a measure of dry matter, the fry color, 
which uh, of course is one of the fun things that we do differently in potato compared to other species. We make a lot of potato chips. And uh, again, this is where some changes were made. Initially, we were just using a visual rating primarily um, because it, it works quite well if your goal is simply to just select um, you know, varieties for select clones to advance as varieties, the visual rating does a pretty good job. As soon as you want to start to build quantitative prediction models and know something about heritabilities, you want to get a bit more precise with your phenotyping. So we switch to uh, actually measuring them in a colorimeter, which takes a little bit more time, but I think leads for a better model. And then the, the vine maturity, which uh, again, it was present previously always done with the visual selection, and now we're moving towards UAV-based measurements. There are, of course, many other traits that, that uh, a potato breeder would measure in this year three, this preliminary yield trial. And you know we give visual scores for all kinds of things related to the appearance, uh, the shape of the potatoes. We cut the potatoes open and measure defects inside. We just measure incidence of diseases that are not based on dedicated trials. It's just, you know, field levels of inoculum. I've looked at these different traits and have concluded for the most part, I'm not really sure what their value would be for genomic selection at this point, either because, um, you know, they're a visual synthesis of a lot of underlying traits when I give an appearance score. So what's really the quantitative genetic basis for that? Um, other traits like hollow heart have very, you know, they're, they don't meet the normal that you'd have to have more complicated types of statistical models. You can't use normal linear models to analyze these traits because of their distributions and so on. So there's a number of a variety of reasons why I haven't tried using other traits, even though um, we have them. And so in the end, ultimately, you still have to use that information in some ad hoc way. And uh, that's where the art of plant breeding comes in. Not, not everything is boiled down to a single number. You do have to start to balance other pieces of information which is something that you learn how to do uh, as a plant breeder one way or the other. What this looks like in terms of then uh, the recurrent selection part of it, right? I mean, the, 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 the scheme just shows the process of starting from across and trying to select a variety for release, but really the main impact of genomic selection is allowing you to select the parents sooner than you would have otherwise based on their predicted breeding values. So based on traditional practices. If I look, for example, at the pedigree records that I inherited, I can see how advanced were the clones that were being used as parents. And I can tell you that they would usually wait at least five to could be you know 10 years, keep, keep using parents for up to 10 years um, past their point that they were first created. So this leads to a breeding cycle that is very likely much longer than is optimal. You know, shortening a breeding cycle is just not something that is you know, historically was not really, really really emphasized in plant breeding education like it is in animal breeding. I think there's a much greater awareness of this now that the key thing is you need to go as fast as you can without overly compromising your accuracy. That's something I'm gonna come back to in a minute. But with this idea of genotyping all of the individuals in our preliminary yield trial to build up the training set, those then also become selection candidates. So this is coming back to this idea of genome-wide marker-assisted selection that I mentioned earlier. And the, the net effect is that I can have up to a four-year, um, as short as a four-year cycle with this. Now, sometimes clones in year four or year five still have the highest predicted breeding value, and that can happen. So it's not that you necessarily have to have a complete turnover of your parents every year. It's actually, that's probably not a good idea, even if that were what the model would suggest. Having a little bit of overlap from your parents from um, year to year is, is a good thing. And in case, for those of you who maybe don't have a clear concept of this, it's not like we wait until we hit the preliminary yield trial and then we start to make crosses again. That would mean you'd only make crosses every four years. No, every year, every stage of this program is happening. So you have overlapping generations, which again, makes it more complicated to understand the genetic gain implications. But um, nonetheless, basically at any given point in time, I have a list of the best clones and I hang on to them until they get bumped off the list and then I don't need them as parents anymore. So that's practically how, how I manage this. The accuracies that we're expecting based on the model can be computed from the stage-wise software, for example, or any other way. And a, a useful, a common question is, well, how high of an accuracy do I need? And that's a very difficult question to answer. 
uh, so I won't attempt to do it really. You, you have to do simulations and know a lot about, again, the economics of your situation to know what would be good enough. But at least one frame of reference is to just compare your breeding value reliability to the estimated neurosense heritability. That corresponds to the what a, a reliability of phenotypic selection would be. So the, the expected uh, heritability is for the, if we were to do phenotypic selection based on one plot in, uh, in that year three, these are the reliabilities we would realize, right, between 0.3 and almost 0.5. And for every one of these four traits, the, the reliability of the breeding values is, is 0.3 higher. So, uh, you know, that's one way of gauging how well you're doing. Um, let me now turn to this topic of how do you integrate data from multiple traits? And we were having a little bit of conversation about that over the lunch break. Um, the, way I've, the way I've used multiple traits until I started doing genomic selection, I think is common, is that I use the independent calling method, meaning that if a clone didn't meet what I considered the uh, an arbitrary, you know, the acceptable standard or standard based on what the check varieties uh, actually, let's put it this way. The, the threshold that uh, I want to have for each trait, if the clone doesn't meet that threshold, and that's the commercially required threshold, it doesn't matter if it's great in nine other traits, you know, it doesn't meet the requirements of the market. And of course, having check varieties every year helps you gauge the fact that those thresholds, you know, they do vary somewhat. But nonetheless, independent calling is a very reasonable way of doing selection when you're talking about trying to find commercial varieties but it doesn't work really that well for parent selection because when you make crosses, you parents compensate each other, right? So you can have a variety that's deficient slightly in one trait. And that's ideally where you would find a complementary parent so that the offspring have the potential of being right, exceptional in all areas. So a very right, easy and tried and true method of doing this is to make indices, which are linear combinations of the breeding values of traits. When your traits are uncorrelated, you can analyze each trait independently and then just make the index using whatever you believe the right weights should be. The problem comes when you have correlated traits, then you can't combine the traits in that way and naively. You don't actually get the right weighting because of those correlations. And that's where this multiple trait blow-up analysis is needed. And that's what I already introduced in my last talk. Um, in the context of locations. And now instead of having an index over locations, we're having an index over traits. Everything else is the same idea. So that's what's illustrated in vignette three. We're going back to the, um, the first data set. So a single location now over multiple years, but now we're gonna start to look at the traits in combination with each other. And a very classic example of correlated traits in plant breeding is yield and maturity, that they tend to be positively correlated and therefore, if you just naively select for yield, you will also get later maturity, which has then negative consequences, typically in terms of when you can do the harvest or the quality of what you're harvesting. So in potato, you can get the skins peel off or the sugars are too high and they don't fry well and many other uh, uh, consequences. The syntax is nearly identical. The only difference is that when you call stage one, you give it a vector which has more than one trait listed. Everything else about what effects you want to include in the model looks exactly the same. And stage two looks identical, so I won't put that up again. Now, when you look at the output from stage two, you now start to see some differences. So this is um, the partitioning of the variance table that you get. And this is showing an example where I've included a fixed effect marker that tags this uh, major gene that affects maturity in potato. And we can see that it's about 10% of the variance for vine maturity, only about 2% of the variance for total yield. But then interestingly, when you look at the partitioning of covariance between the traits, that that, that gene, or at least that marker linked to that gene appears to explain 12% of the covariance. So it's you know, important in terms of, uh, of, of the trade-off between yield and maturity, but there's still a significant amount of variance that's due to the polygenic additive effect and non-additive or residual genetic effects are also contributing a large part of the covariance. The correlation matrix that you get as the output also, just like before with the locations above the diagonal would be your additive correlation, uh, which would include the contribution of any fixed effects. And then below the diagonal is the total genotypic correlation where the residual genetic term is added. 
So here's one example of, of doing this calculation. Let's imagine we're going to try and select for yield, and we'll make two indices. The first index, index one, uh, when you give the index weights argument to BLUP, you only put a you only put some weight on yield. The weight for maturity would be zero in this example. So that would be pure selection for yield. Index two, I'm going to put some negative weight on maturity. Uh, I guess I forgot to emphasize. Look at this value of 0.5 for a correlation, additive correlation. That's a pretty high correlation. Clearly, we have to think about controlling for maturity if we don't want to get our germplasm. Uh, push to later maturity when we select for yield. So in this case, the, tr the maturity is rated on a score such that higher, numerically higher values of maturity are later and they're positively correlated. And that means to avoid getting later maturity, I have to put a negative weight on the index coefficient for, for maturity. And then you can, for example, look at what is the ranking of your genotypes under these two indices. Uh, and right, some some clones uh, they may have about the same rank if the maturity for them is about average. And something like this blue individual here, this blue clone, uh, dropped in rank quite heavily, probably because it it must have been uh, relatively late compared to the group. So it, uh, it doesn't do as well under the under the second index. Okay, so that's a simple, but I think pretty useful example of how index selection can be used with multiple traits. One thing that I was mentioning during the break was just, there are limitations to how many traits you can analyze with AS Reml. It doesn't, it doesn't really have, good, in my experience at least, trying to use sparse models for the traits. They don't work as well as they do sparse models for the location. So whereas you can have no problem analyzing 10 locations, uh, I'm not sure you could get 10 traits to run in a data set this big uh, with AS Reml, um, at least not on a regular computer. So, but fortunately in practice, you don't typically have, at least as far as normal traits, not like, uh, I'm not talking about traits like from a, a drone where you'll have many indices or many, you know, many wavelengths that are all highly collinear. But it, typical traits, you're not going to have more than a couple that probably have an, a significant enough correlation that you really need to worry about doing the multi trait analysis. So, at least for, the way I'm thinking about this is I'll, I'll look at you know, maturity and, and yield together, for example, as two correlated traits, and I'll calculate um, you know, the blup for, that, for yield that way. If I've got, uh, there's some correlation between dry matter and fry color, so I can analyze those two as a correlated trait, and then I can make an index that combines those two. So you can kind of split your, traps, your traits maybe up into clusters or groups and analyze each one of those groups, and any one group probably isn't going to have more than right, four or five traits, so it should be more tractable in terms of making it work with the software. Okay, now I want to come back to this concept of you know, accuracy versus um, speed. And that's one of the fundamental challenges of plant breeding. You want to go as fast as you can be, to uh, reduce your breeding cycle, but you don't want to overly compromise your accuracy. I mean, ultimately, you can accept some accuracy going faster because ultimately what matters is the gain per time, not the gain per cycle, right? So if you can get multiple cycles in the same period of time, you can accept a lower accuracy, but not, there is a point at which the accuracy becomes so low that it's actually worse than going slower. So faster is not uniformly better. And that's where it's difficult to really know the optimal speed without doing simulations. Um, as soon as you start to go fast enough that you don't have any phenotypes available for your selection candidates, that would be the more traditional understanding of what genomic selection means. I often refer to it as marker-based selection, which is a terminology that Rex Bernardo has also you know, advocated for. Just a, the marker-assisted implies you have phenotypes, whereas the marker-based implies you do not have phenotypes. So anyways, they're both types of genomic selection. But with the software, for example, you can easily calculate what would be the expected reliability when you have the phenotypes, that's this column labeled MAS. And then when you don't have the phenotypes, that's this column labeled MBS. And the reliability is lower of the breeding values as it, it, should, it should be intuitively. If you have never measured anything about that, if you've never measured that clone, you won't be able to predict its breeding value as well. But if, we go, if it means we can go faster, maybe it really uh, is still better in terms of long-term gain. Um, so what is the optimal cycle length for potato? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we've done some simulations, but also had some turnover with uh, students working on this project. So 
At this point, I'm still left a little bit guessing that probably uh, going one year faster than I have been is going to, I'm pretty sure that's going to be better. I don't know if going two years faster would be better, but I'm just going to start by going one year faster, meaning instead of having the four-year breeding cycle that I've been using for the last couple of years, I'm going to try and go to a three-year breeding cycle. But the main reason I haven't tried to do this sooner was that uh, the genotyping platform we've been using that we are comfortable with, the SNP array, is really too expensive to, to realize this in, in the right way. Uh, I, can't fully, I can't genotype all individuals in my, in my year two trial at the price point that I had available. Fortunately, which a fantastic opportunity um, opened up to work with the Excellence in Breeding Program and SIP, the International Potato Center, to identify a subset of SNPs from our array that we could then genotype at a lot cheaper using a targeted Amplicon sequencing methodology. And uh, kudos to uh, DART, uh, the company in Australia that has this DART tag technology because it's been working well for us. So we finally, uh, this past year, we were able to genotype all of the individuals in our year two trial, which is five, about roughly five times the number of individuals in our year three. And the price point is about, it's about 20% of the price. So for the same amount I was paying before to genotype 150 clones in my year three, I can now genotype 750 clones in my year two. Now, of course, I only get 2,000 markers instead of over 10,000. But for uh, genomic selection and with some imputation, I'll talk about in a second, it still works pretty well. But here you can see, I guess, conceptually what I'm talking about in terms of trying to make the breeding cycle go one year faster. All right, so how do we combine marker data sets that uh, come from different platforms? So uh, I worked on this a long time ago, about 10 years ago, when I was working um, as a postdoc with, with uh, wheat breeding using GBS. In the case of GBS, you, you have uh, it's... You, you also have a missing data problem with GBS, except that it's the, the missingness is, I won't say it's not at random, but it's, it's distributed. Every line is missing something typically, but at, at different markers. So it's not like you can say, well, this group of individuals has data for this set, complete data for this set of markers and not this set of markers. Whereas when we talk about going from fixed marker panels, whether it's by an array or a targeted sequencing, it's typically more like that. Right? You have a, a set of individuals that you have genotyped at the high density and a different set at low density. So the, the algorithms that we had developed, which are in the Ara blood package that would impute GBS data, we really don't have to do the iterative approach that we had done before. We can just do essentially one iteration. And that's what is available as part of the poly breeder package. It's not well documented, but um, you, can, you can read the, the, the syntax in the reference manual and that function is called merge impute. It will take um, data from uh, two different panels of individuals genotyped at two different densities and will combine them all together for you and do the imputation. That uh, I haven't actually done, I've done some casual benchmarking to see that it's working well. I haven't done a whole lot, but I can, I, I, I'm hoping to do better than just that uh, imputation by exploiting the population structure in, in particular because. We know what the pedigree structure of this population is, so we should be able to use that to do a better job than, than what Blup can just do naively. And uh, we've demonstrated that this is possible using the poly origin package, um, <clears throat> which only works for tetrapoid species at the moment. And it also requires that you already have phased parental genotypes or that you can get phased parental genotypes. And um, we don't really have that available yet for all of our parents, but we're getting there. So hoping to, to make that transition. And if you're in that situation, I, I would recommend exploring that idea. Uh, another interesting aspect of our um, going one year faster is that I, I alluded to the, I, I was giving you the impression a moment ago that we weren't measuring any of these traits in year two, which is actually not quite true. One of the traits we do measure, we measure specific gravity. That was one of the traits that we had our prediction model for. But the, the year two trial is at a different location than our later trials. It, it's before we go to the commercial region of our state. And so there's been a question for, in my mind, which is how, how correlated are the specific gravity data we measure at our seed farm relative to the specific gravities we've been measuring that are used in our prediction models? 
Well, that, that analysis is actually quite easy to do now with the stage-wise package. Uh, just treat that as a, as a correlated location. And uh, here you can see the, the G by location and the, the um, genotype by location analysis. And the correlation is about 0.82 for specific gravity. Um, <clears throat> The correlation, uh, we also used to measure fry color, and uh, I don't have the results here, but the correlation for fry color was quite a bit lower. I don't remember the exact number, but low enough that I've stopped measuring fry color. We're not making potato chips anymore at our, um, our seed farm because it didn't really seem like it was worth the time relative to the quality of the data. But the practical uh, idea is that we're now going to use the specific gravity, gravity we measure in this year two trial as a correlated location, but I'm going to give it zero weight in the selection index because what I want to predict is gravity in the commercial environments, not in this seed environment, even though the seed environment is highly correlated. So by giving a zero weight in the index, I can, I can achieve that. And we can see that uh, using the correlated data improves my, um, my, predicted, my prediction reliability. So the y-axis is the marker-assisted genome-wide predictions um, using the year two data as a correlated trait, which is uniformly higher for this set of individuals than the x-axis, which is uh, not using it. Okay, my last few minutes, I've just got a couple slides talking about uh, what sometimes I say is the problem with breeding values, which basically gets at the question of how do you actually do genomic, use genomic selection in a wise way so that you can think about long-term gains. Because if you just select on breeding value, all you're really doing is maximizing genetic gain for the next generation. There's no intrinsic consideration of genetic diversity if you simply rank individuals by breeding value and pick the top X percent based on a truncation selection. You will find that the best individuals in your ranking will tend to be closely related. And so you're gonna to start to erode genetic diversity significantly. And this has been observed in um, some interesting studies, retrospective studies in dairy cattle breeding when they switched to genomic selection from their pedigree selection, just to see how much genetic diversity started to erode more quickly. And then you need to start to make adjustments. So we wanna go into this with our eyes um, wide open. The traditional approach to balancing the, uh, the, the, the short-term gain with the long-term diversity in animal breeding goes by the name optimum contribution selection or OCS, which uh, I don't have time to go into much detail other than just make you, make, make you aware of this if you're interested, but basically it boils down to an optimization problem where you're gonna specify uh, a number between zero and one, a fractional number that represents the contribution of your individual to the next generation, right? How many crosses or how many progeny of this individual do you want to put in the next cohort of your breeding program? So you have this criterion that you're gonna try and optimize is some linear combination of the breeding values by their contribution for these individuals. These sums are over the N individuals, the N, the N uh, parental candidates. So if you just select on breeding value, you'd be looking at this first part of the, of the criterion, but then you put this penalty, which depends upon, this A means the um, pedigree relationship matrix, or you can also use the genomic relationship matrix but it's gonna to start to penalize if you put too much contribution between individuals that are closely related, it's going to reduce your overall criterion. And this is by controlling this parameter lambda, which is what you balance between these two different terms, that's how much you can control how important inbreeding is. And ultimately, how the question is, how do you know what this parameter lambda should be, right? It's an ad hoc parameter. There are certain rules of thumb that exist in animal breeding that have been developed over long periods of time that seem to work well. Um, there are also simulations you can do to try and understand what might this be for plant breeding programs. And there's been a lot of interesting research in the last couple of years trying to do that. Um, here's uh, an example of one program called AlphaMate that will do this calculation. Um, and they uh, talk about here, interesting ways of visualizing the two axes here. The, the Y axis is the the uh, gain in terms of breeding values and the x-axis is the diversity axis. So this is sometimes called the gain diversity plane. And every, this black line, every, every solution to the breeding, selecting your parents, every, every solution here is optimal with respect to a different value of lambda or penalty for inbreeding. 
Ultimately, you have to do simulations to know what that should be, which I don't have time to go into. But just to show you one, this is what it looked like for our potato breeding data set to do something like this. The x-axis is measuring the penalty. So the higher the penalty I'm putting, the more I'm going to emphasize diversity and less genetic gain. And what you see, the different colors here are all different parents that I'm considering. If you have no penalty for diversity, the software picks the cross that had the two best parents. And it says, just make all of your, you use all the progeny from that one cross for your next generation, right? Because any other progeny is predicted to have lower breeding value. I actually know a potato breeder who did that one year. I think he regretted to do it. But anyways, you, you know, you, you can do that. But if you, part, if you start to put more penalty, you see that it starts to select more and more individuals to contribute to the next generation. So we're in the very early stages of trying to use some of these techniques to improve our genomic selection. I think I'm out of time, so I'll stop there and look forward to inter interacting with you during the office hours. <laughs>